Welcome everyone uh, to the Global Water Futures Core Modeling and Forecasting Team's uh, topical webinar series. Uh, my name is Prabin Rokhaya. I'm the Science Coordinator of the Core Modeling and Forecasting Team. Uh, it is my pleasure to present you today a webinar entitled Informing Core Regions Hydrology from Space, uh, Development of Terrestrial Storm Mass Mission. Uh, today we have Dr. Chris uh, Dirksen from the Environment and Climate Science Canada. Uh, Dr. Dirksen is a research scientist uh, at the Climate Research Division and also holds an uh, adjunct faculty position with the, uh, with the Department of Geography uh, at the University of Waterloo. Uh, his research activities uh, focus on the use of uh, satellite data and climate models uh, to understand climate and uh, impacts, uh, particularly in, on the Arctic. Uh, Dr. Dirksen has uh, participated in uh, numerous uh, snow and sea uh, ice field campaigns across the Canadian Arctic. Uh, he was a lead author of the International Panel on Climate Change uh, IPCC special report on oceans and cryosphere in a changing climate. Uh, Dr. Dirksen is also a co-editor-in-chief of this journal, The Cryosphere. Uh, he's also the science lead uh, for a new uh, satellite radar mission, uh, which is under development with the Canadian Space Agency, which I believe he will be uh, talking today. Uh, without taking much time, uh, I want to kick off this webinar by thanking uh, Dr. Dirksen for accepting our invitation uh, to present in this webinar series. Uh, the webinar today would be about 45 minutes of presentation, uh, followed by about 15 minutes of question and answer session. Uh, Dr. Dirksen, the floor is yours. Okay, great. <clears throat> Thanks a lot for the introduction. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Everything yeah. seem good technology? Okay, great. So yeah, so my... Uh, my presentation today will eventually get to um, a new satellite mission that we're developing uh, in collaboration uh, with um, the Canadian Space Agency. Oops, let me just get myself sorted here. With the Canadian Space Agency, uh, entitled the Terrestrial Snow Mass Mission. But before, uh, before I get to that, I thought I'd just provide a little bit of background on some of the work we've been doing at Environment and Climate Change Canada on building an ensemble of snow mass products for the Northern Hemisphere, applying these to some sort of climate related questions. Um, and then I think what this does is highlight what we can do uh, with existing gridded uh, snow mass products, but what we're missing out on. And it's that piece of what we're missing, which is providing the motivation for our ongoing development of the terrestrial snow mass mission. So I'll take maybe 15, 20 minutes to first show some examples of the work we're doing uh, with um, snow water equivalent or snow mass data sets across the hemisphere. And then we'll get into the um, terrestrial um, snow mass mission after that. So um, just a bit of background from myself. So I'm based in Toronto. I'm with the Climate Research Division of Environment and Climate Change Canada. I'm presenting really some work um, on behalf of quite a large group of people. So I'll be sure to note kind of which of my colleagues has helped greatly with this work uh, as, I move, as I move through the presentation. And thanks to all of you uh, for, joining, for joining today. So when we think about fresh water from snow melt, I mean, obviously it's, it's a vital commodity for people across the country. Um, and, and, and so when we think about sort of the, the policy needs for improved information on snow mass, the first thing we need to look at is what can we currently do with observations when we look at snow mass across Canada and across all snow covered regions. And the current state of the art um, satellite derived snow mass product, I would say is, is the one that's been developed through the European Space Agency um, CCI program. So I'm showing the climatology of snow mass on the top left here from this, from this satellite product. Um, it goes back about four decades. So we have quite a long time series that we can use um, for climate applications, but there's some real limitations to this product. Number one, uh, it's coarse resolution. So, so the grid spacing is 25 kilometers. Um, in large part because of that coarse grid spacing, it masks out mountain areas. So if we look at the climatology here, you can see over Western Canada into the US, gray areas where no information on SWE is, um, is evident in the product. Same thing with the trends. So the, the trends since 1980 are shown on the bottom panel here, no information over uh, mountain areas. Obviously that's a huge gap because snow in mountain areas is really, uh, you know, a really, a really key uh, piece of the puzzle. As well, this is not a standalone remote sensing product. It relies heavily on surface observations. So it assimilates surface snow depth observations and uses that as part of the retrieval with the satellite passive microwave data um, to estimate SWE. And so it's a really good example of why even as we develop satellite missions uh, now and in the future, 
we still really do have, uh, there really is an important role that surface observations play um, in this in this move towards um, using satellite data to, to look at to look at snow mass. So, so we have some existing products, but there's some really important limitations to them. When we think about freshwater supply across Canada, um, our view at Environment Canada is that there will be increasing pressure on seasonal snow as a water resource in the decades ahead. And that's simply because freshwater supply from glaciers in Western Canada is changing. And I know I don't need to speak to Global Water Futures folks about the importance of that. Um, so just some time series here from our Natural Resources Canada colleagues that show um, the impact of a warming climate on the mass of glaciers in both the Arctic and in Western Canada. Um, climate model simulations you know, indicate that by the end of this century, this water resource will be largely uh, gone. So that needs to be augmented from somewhere and clearly more knowledge of seasonal snow um, is needed to help uh, address that gap. So this is sort of the, the context, the space uh, in which we're, we're operating. So a little bit more on this Snow CCI product, which has heritage to a project called Globe Snow, which was also European Space Agency funded. It's, as I mentioned, a, a 25 kilometer spaced, uh, grid, grid spaced product. Um, it uses a data assimilation approach to combine surface snow depth observations with satellite passive microwave data. It's been validated uh, intensively across the non-mountain areas of the Northern Hemisphere. And the performance is quite good, uh, but we still have this challenge where we're masking out mountain areas where um, we really have, we're really pushing what we can get out of this product uh, for certain uh, places. And one thing I wanna emphasize is that, you know, we don't wanna rely on one sole source of information for snow water equivalent or snow mass data. It's great that we can use remote sensing for this, but really we wanna look at sort of an ensemble approach where we look at different methods um, to derive uh, snow mass information. So some of the work I've been involved with in the past has not done this. When we've evaluated climate models, we typically uh, in the past have used one observational data set to assess historical model performance. Um, and therefore it leads to some uncertainty in how we can assess climate model performance. Um, it sort of pushes us to try to make a decision over what single data set we think is best. Um, sometimes we just use the most uh, lengthy time series of data that's uh, uh, available. And really, I think I want to emphasize that this analysis can give the false impression that we know what reality is, and that's the one time series shown on these plots, for instance. And then we have this spread of information that comes from climate models. So this is some work that I did a few years ago now with my colleague, Ross, Ross Brown, where we used only one source of information to look at snow extent across the hemisphere. We compared the observations in red, that satellite derived information to the climate models from CNIP5 in black, and, and so you see this uh, portrayal of the reality, the historical truth as one single line and the climate model output as some range. So a multi-model mean in the solid or thicker black line and then some range of, of, uh, of estimates from all the uh, available models. Clearly this is, is not the impression that we should be giving because there's uncertainty in the observations. We wanna capture some of that too. So that's really motivated us to go from this type of uh, approach and develop an ensemble of, of snow information. So how do we do this? Well, we have earth observation products. Some of it from optical imagery tells us information on snow extent. So the NOAA climate data record is one of the longer serving data sets that goes back to the 1960s. The Japanese colleagues have produced this JASMES product, um, also from, from optical satellite remote sensing. We have passive microwave data, both from ESA and from NASA. And then we really have this great family of reanalysis driven products. So some of them include assimilation, some of them don't. So MERA2, we can run the Crocus snow model forced by era interim and era five. Ross Brown is a very simple temperature index model for snow. Then there's kind of other reanalysis products like ERA-5 that do assimilate both surface observations and satellite data into their, um, into their system. So there really isn't a shortage of products. We have this large family of available snow mass products. And so ideally we wanna use these together to give us um, a better quantification of the uncertainty um, in, in, in snow mass. And so if you think about building up an ensemble like this, Ideally, we would want to use 
an equal amount of, from different classes of snow products. So we want to use some earth observation data. We want to use some reanalysis driven products. The more we can sample across independent product types, the better we'll be able to capture you know, uncertainty um, that we miss out on by using just a single product. So my colleague Colleen Mortimer led a study that was published last year that evaluated uh, this large family of products across the hemisphere using reference uh, snow course measurements. So I'll provide a few details um, on that work right now. So Colleen put a lot of work, we know this is not a trivial effort, but Colleen, um, supported by uh, Global Water Futures Associated People and Vincent Vionnet, who uh, is now with us at Environment and Climate Change Canada, they pulled together uh, a reference snow course data set that covers Northern Hemisphere snow covered uh, areas. It includes data from across Russia, it includes data from Finland, uh, Canadian data from both uh, federal and provincial agencies. And then as well, data from uh, the US, both in New England from the, uh, some state level sources here, and then the NRCS network. Um, and so a big thanks to some of our Global Water Futures folks through Martin Clark support who helped provide the NRCS data. So now we have this quite extensive reference snow course data set. There's still some gaps in it. We'd like to get data from you know, Sweden and Norway, some of the other countries in Europe. It's not perfect. You can see there's parts of Canada with very few uh, observations, obviously, parts of the US as well. But we're starting to build up uh, a reference data set of snow course measurements that covers you know, the predominant snow climate classes across the hemisphere. It's important to also just capture that these data sets don't sample continuously through time. These are largely uh, manual snow course measurements. So observers go out at certain times of the year so you get this, uh, as these time series plots show here, the number of observations goes up and down during the season, tends to peak later in the year, say close to March or April 1st time period of, uh, of, of, of peak SWE. But spatially and temporally, we've now built up, I think this really interesting um, data set of snow course observations. The subset of data over Canada are now, uh, the paper is now in this discussion. And so I think, um, people will become more aware of these data and hopefully um, will be put to good use. So this is our reference data set for evaluating these different gridded, uh, gridded snow mass products. And what Colleen's analysis showed, um, there's a lot of information that I've tried to distill down onto a single uh, graphic here, but each of the product types um, is shown across the x-axis. And then we have results for the bias, the correlation, the root mean square error, and then the root mean square error expressed as a percentage of mean of, of mean SWE. So of these products on the left, most of them are reanalysis uh, based or reanalysis driven. And then there's a couple earth observation products on the right. So the one thing that sort of stands out uh, with the performance metrics is that these AMSERI, these are satellite passive microwave derived products from NASA. Their performance is poor compared to the other suite of products. It's very hard to identify which is the best individual product. That's okay. Um, the message here, or what we want to do here, was see if there were any products that we should exclude from our uh, ensemble as we start to, to combine these products together. So this, the analysis with the reference measurements shows very clearly that these AMPs are standalone remote sensing products that don't use any surface observations. Um, they might be a, a bit of a problem. When we look at the um, anomalies spatially from each product and we correlate them together, that's what these maps are showing. So these are correlation maps of anomalies through the entire snow cover season. So all the various reanalysis based snow analyses have very high correlation to each other. So that's a very encouraging result. That means that these products are capturing the same anomalies in space through time. And then when we compute the same for Globe Snow 2, which is Earth observation based, and ERA 5, kind of a new state of the art um, reanalysis system, we also see quite strong correlations with some regional um, um, challenge spots maybe popping up. But again, we're quite, quite confident that we're getting at least similar information from this whole family of products. We don't see that with the, with the AMSA re products. So here the correlation values are, for the anomalies are quite low, and in some cases um, below zero negative. So this indicates that there's not good agreement with these AMSRE products with the snow analyses. So this suggests when we combine this type of analysis with 
the uh, metrics from the snow course data comparison that, okay, there's some products that as we start to build up an ensemble, while we can't identify the best product, we can identify poorly performing products that we should exclude from climate analysis moving forward. So that another way to look at this and to sort of further illustrate this issue that there's no single best performing product, what we've done here is start to build up an ensemble of snowmass products with different sizes. So how many different numbers of individual products in the ensemble. And the key here is that as we increase the number of products in the ensemble, when we drop out the poor performing products, we get a reduction in RMSE, so that's good. And we get an increase in correlation, also good, uh, compared to the snow course data. So this suggests that there's some error cancellation, some bias cancellation that goes on between these different products that as you start to average them together, you start to get better performance. And so this provides, we think some pretty compelling evidence that we're better off because none of these products is perfect. We're better off uh, averaging a number of these um, largely independent snow mass data sets together, probably at least three or four products uh, to build up uh, an ensemble of, of snow mass information. So when we do that, we can apply these in a number of different ways. So my colleague, Lawrence Mudrick has done some work that I'll focus on in the next couple of slides. He's led this work. So we can use this ensemble of products to look at trends. So these plots show the anomalies in Northern hemisphere snow extent across the top, snow mass in the bottom using this multi data set um, uh, approach. And, and really what's interesting is that we see negative trends, perhaps not, uh, shouldn't surprise us, but we see negative snow extent trends and negative snow mass trends um, in all months of the year. And, and this is a little bit different than what we find if we use one product on its own. And one thing, one product I'll maybe pick on a bit here is the NOAA climate data record. It indicates a positive trend in snow extent in October. Um, and that's not replicated in any of the other products. So, it sort of just provides evidence that if we if we average some of these data sets together, um, we think we'll be able to remove some of the outliers and provide a more kind of coherent and consistent picture for what trends are uh, across the hemisphere. What Lawrence has also done is isolate out the Arctic contribution. So for some climate assessments, we wanted to focus on just Arctic snow cover. So that's separated out now in these plots. So the anomalies for the Arctic snow are shown on the right. You get very weak anomalies in March. Uh, and earlier and during the winter because uh, Arctic is completely snow covered during those months. So the snow extent anomalies are quite weak, but we can see in the spring, this movement towards earlier snow melt, later snow arrival in the fall, and then snow mass anomalies are also largely uh, negative over recent decades. <clears throat> These column plots on the left show the Arctic contribution to the nor Northern hemisphere trend values. So again, trends are negative in all months, and you can see, particularly during the shoulder seasons, so May and June, uh, October, um, the Arctic makes a significant contribution to what the hemispheric trends are for both snow extent and snow mass. So again, all of these trend and anomaly information comes from a family, an ensemble of products uh, averaged together. Our colleagues at Environment Canada who do seasonal prediction um, have also looked at how well they can evaluate or verify using kind of hindcast model simulations, um, their predictions of snow mass across the hemisphere. And what they find is that if they choose an individual product, so these colors, so green is uh, era interim, pink is Mara land, the cyan color is Mara, era interim land is in red. And these are the ver verification statistics for lead time predictions of snow mass uh, across the hemisphere. And what's interesting is that you actually get apparently like the, the verification of the model looks stronger, the model performs better when you verify using the blended five or the average of a number of products averaged together. So that suggests that using an observational ensemble actually provides more, uh, in this case, uh, positive results for them and a more robust approach to looking at the predictive skill uh, at seasonal time scales. We've also looked at coupled climate models. So there's a couple families of a uh, couple climate models we can look at. So CMIP5 is the previous generation of Earth system models. And then CMIP6 is the new current, um, current era 
of models. And what we're showing here is snow extent across the top, snow mass across the bottom. Observations are in the green violin plots here, and the model simulations are in the uh, box plots. Actually, I make sure I got that right. So the, yeah, the box plots is the um, is the model. And what you can see is that, um, so the green violins are the same between these two plots because it's observations, but CMIP-5 models, the older generation of climate models has a tendency to systematically underestimate Northern hemisphere snow extent, the climatology historically compared to observations. The new generation of climate models um, show better agreement. So now we have better overlap historically between the CMIP-6 simulations and uh, the range captured by our ensemble of observations. This is moving things in the right direction. This is a nice result for our climate modeling colleagues to show that internationally, this new generation of climate models collectively performs better uh, for snow extent than um, the older uh, era of climate models. The story is maybe a little bit um, less clear with snow mass. So here again, we're showing CMIP-5 on the left and CMIP-6 on the right. There isn't evidence of this clear improvement in CMIP-6 that we saw in CMIP-5. There's a couple of different reasons for this. Maybe the most important one I'll highlight is that we still don't have a ton of confidence in these green observations for snow mass. We know we're underestimating snow mass with these gridded products in mountain areas. Mountains store a ton of snow. So that's really um, driving this. So while the models appear to be overestimating snow mass compared to observations, this could very well be an issue more with the observations than with the models. And so we'll be looking into this in a bit more detail uh, moving forward. But again, just an example of how we can use these ensemble of products to show how historically um, snow conditions compare to um, different generations of, of climate model simulations. And finally, how will snow extent evolve in the future? Um, so one thing that this doesn't involve the historical ensemble of observations, but I thought I would include this slide anyways, because I think it's quite interesting. The colors on this plot uh, that my colleague Lawrence Mudrick uh, provided to me, the colors indicate different CMIP-6 um, socioeconomic pathways, so projections into the future. The warmer colors are the more carbon intensive, greater levels of warming. And what we're seeing here on the x-axis is the global surface air temperature change into the future. And the y-axis is the normalized northern hemisphere snow cover change. Um, and so what you see is that there's a really, really strong temperature sensitivity that as climate models project greater warming, this results in loss of snow cover. And it's, it's quite independent to individual models. So, so this really shows that we can expect about 8% um, loss of snow cover per degree Celsius per degree Celsius of global surface air temperature increase. And now we have the sensitivity of snow cover to temperature forcing that's, that's really strong and um, that we can really simply scale our expected rate of snow cover loss to the rate of warming into the future. And that's not dissimilar to what we've seen for other fast response components of the cryosphere like sea ice, uh, near surface permafrost extent. All of these conditions of the cryosphere respond quite quickly um, to surface temperature forcing. So that's just one slide to show you what we might expect in the future with respect to changing snow cover. Okay, so that's just an overview of, of how, you know, at Environment Canada, we're using different snow cover products to answer uh, or to address different questions involving historical trends, involving seasonal prediction, uh, involving climate model um, changes in snow cover. But I really want to get back to you know, how we ground this in observational information, the important role that Earth observation could play um, in, in helping us do this. And so I'll just bring up this slide once more to, to show again that sort of current state of the art Earth observation derived snow mass products don't provide any information on mountain areas. So that's the red masking in this image here. Um, and they're 25 kilometer grid spacing. So they're not appropriate for a lot of um, applications. So what are we doing about that? How do we address this sort of fundamental observing gap where we don't have um, snow observations um, from space at a resolution that are ideal um, for many different user needs? So I'll, I'll spend the rest of my presentation talking about the terrestrial snow mass mission, and this will help us 
address that observation gap. So at this point, I'm presenting on behalf of a number of colleagues at Environment Canada and also CSA, who we've worked hard with for a number of years now, um, starting with an assessment of what remote sensing options are there to help us address this gap, and then what is the best tool moving forward. And so based on previous work um, funded by CSA, uh, Canadian industry identified KU band radar as a technological solution that could be put into space that would help us um, address our, our snow mass needs. And there's some heritage here to previous missions. The European Space Agency developed a mission called Core H2O a number of years ago. It moved successfully through the competitive process at ESA until ultimately in 2013, it was not selected um, as a full mission, but a lot of funding, a lot of effort was put into advancing the science for that mission. And we're sort of piggybacking on all the success uh, of the Core H2O effort. So our objective here is to provide 500 meter uh, KU band radar measurements covering all of Canada every five to seven days. And this moderate resolution, while it's not perfect, um, is a big step forward from the 25 kilometer grid spacing that we currently have with satellite data. Um, it would allow us to get a rapid revisit time, which our uh, forecasting colleagues uh, really want to see. So I'll provide more details in subsequent slides about what this mission um, will look like. Some of the drivers for why we're pushing this, um, this mission forward now. I mean, I don't think I need to convince any of you that snow is important from a natural resource point of view, from a commodity point of view, and from a flood risk perspective, better information on snow and snow melt has real economic value to Canadians. But aside from that, we're also at a point, I think within not just at Environment Canada, but internationally, certainly across Canada, where we have modeling systems that are now ready and equipped to utilize better snow information, to be initialized in a more uh, rigorous way for snow. If we improve the initial conditions, for these model modeling systems, the hope is then we'll improve stream flow forecasts, especially at kind of longer lead times, so maybe two weeks or longer, where the snow mass initialization has real importance for the stream flow forecast, as opposed to the meteorological forcing, for instance. And so, um, you know, the community has made significant progress in understanding uh, KU band radar response to snow, both in Europe, in Canada, and in the US. There's been funded programs to look at this. And finally, a final piece of the puzzle is that industry has made great strides in developing low cost, low mass uh, spaceborne radar platforms that we could use or adapt for this type of, of, of mission. Satellite radar is expensive to develop. Um, and so we wanna do it in the most uh, cost effective way. So if we can accomplish all this at Environment Canada, the hope is to use this information to address questions around climate services and water availability. So how much water is stored as snow? How does it vary in space and time? You know, very obvious questions, but deceptively difficult to answer. And then from a prediction point of view, what's the contribution of snow to the water cycle? How well, we, how well can we predict it? How well can satellite information, you know, improve our ability to predict the role of snow within the water cycle? So why KU band radar? Just a quick slide on this. These are measurements provided by colleagues in Finland using a tower-based radar system. So we're showing two KU band frequencies, 13.3 gigahertz and 16.7. Uh, we have two years of data, solid symbols and hollow symbols are two different years. And then the lines show what radar models suggest the backscatter should be doing as you change the snow mass. So the SWE is on the x-axis and the backscatter is on the y-axis. So you can see this response of the backscatter, especially at the, the cross-pole data, that as you increase the snow water e equivalent, you see a commensurate response in the backscatter. Now, ideally it would be simple enough that we could take the backscatter and relate it directly to the SWE. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. And that's because the snow microstructure kind of gets in the way. So by snow microstructure, we're really getting down here to the, the snow crystal level the impact of snow grain microstructure on KU band volume scatter within the snowpack. And what the center plot shows is across a range of snow depths, the backscatter for four different snow grain sizes. So you can see there is a response, the backscatter intensity changes as you vary the snow depth, but in many ways it's, it's overridden by the change in the magnitude of the backscatter due to the snow grain size. So this suggests that you need to know something about the snow grain size before you can retrieve SWE. So our colleagues in Finland have developed a couple of frameworks to do this. 
using either the radar measurements themselves or passive microwave data. If you initialize the retrieval that, to account for the microstructure, if you constrain the retrieval, it turns out you can do a pretty good job. You can retrieve SWE with an R squared of about 0.75, quite good bias. Um, and so this is sort of the pathway forward that we're taking with the mission. Learn something about the microstructure, inform the retrieval about the snow microstructure, and then you end up with an estimate of the snow mass. I'll provide a little bit more detail in a bit about how we're gonna implement this within processing chains at Environment Canada. A little more detail on the KU band radar mission. I won't go into details on this table. If you're really into radar, the performance specs for the radar system are shown here. Um, what I will point out is there has not been a KU band synthetic aperture radar in space before. This would be the first mission of its type. Uh, because of that, our industrial partners have developed what we're calling an explorer scale mission. So that means we compromise on a few uh, design choices with the radar to bring the cost down. Uh, and by doing that, it will allow us to show technological innovation. We can prove that the science is viable, but we'll do it with reduced overall risk. The lower the cost, the lower the risk. And so we want to be able to, because it's the first mission of its type, uh, do this in a uh, 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 efficient way. So we, we will take measurements at two different frequencies, the same frequencies that I showed uh, previously across a 250 kilometer wide swath, which means we can cover all of Canada every five to seven days at 500 meter grid spacing. Now we've also, we'll be including a higher resolution mode so we can get 50 meter data as well. I think this will be quite useful for mountain regions, for instance, but you have to sacrifice the swath width. So when we, when we switch imaging modes for the radar, it'll go from 250 kilometers to only 30 kilometers. And I'll show you in a minute what that looks like across Canada. Obviously we sacrifice coverage um, to improve the grid spacing. Um, we really need to have the radar operating for a long time each orbit. So um, the, the more you operate a radar, the more power you need, the more heat the satellite produces that you have to deal with. So our industry partners had to work pretty hard to come up with a concept that will allow us to operate the SAR 25% of each orbit, but that means we will be able to cover actually all Northern Hemisphere um, snow covered land uh, during the winter. Hopefully we'll run the mission for three winter seasons. Um, and, and we haven't fixed the orbit yet, uh, but probably around a seven day repeat orbit. So this is what the coverage map looks like for a seven day repeat orbit. Um, so the colors indicate the, re, the re, revisit time. It's a polar orbiting satellite. So um, we get convergence over the pole. So over Arctic Canada, you get daily coverage. It goes down to about three days in the subarctic. And then there's just the way the orbits overlap. You, you get a bit more like four to five days across mid latitude parts of Canada, five to six days um, as you get over the US. Um, so this is what the coverage map looks over the hemisphere for the, for, the, for the wide swath mode. What I'm showing here on the map on the right, the wide swaths are 250 kilometers across. The narrow swaths here are the 30 kilometer wide, 50 meter resolution swath. So it gives you a sense of what we would lose in coverage if we switched to that high res mode. So showing the Ottawa, the Red and the Bow rivers just for um, illustrative purposes. So we probably wouldn't want to run it in the 50 meter mode all the time because we would just lose so much coverage. But you could imagine if you had a high magnitude event um, like flood conditions uh, emerging, that it could prove very useful to have the higher resolution option um, at certain locations and certain times of the year. So what will our analysis approach look like? I don't want to get too into the weeds on algorithms but I do wanna just show kind of how we're, how we're envisioning a data flow. And there's really two things we wanna do with the data. We'd like to retrieve snow mass from the radar measurements themselves. And we'd like to assimilate the radar directly into CALDAS. CALDAS is the Canadian land data assimilation system, which is used operationally at uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada. I'll go through each of these steps in a little bit more detail, but it's really important to show that we're really relying on two things. One, we need the radar measurements so that's the you know the backbone obviously of the of 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 the mission is is the satellite radar measurements but we don't want to underestimate or undervalue what's happening at the bottom of this flow chart and that is we need a physical snow model that can provide us with snow microstructure and other constraints to combine with the radar um, remote sensing 
My personal view is that where some radar missions have run into problems in the past is trying to claim they can do too much all the time under all snow conditions. We know realistically uh, it's just impossible. But what a radar is great for is providing some information on the snowpack in many places at many times of the year. So we want to take advantage of that, combine it with modeling, and then lean heavily on this sort of modeling remote sensing combination. That's where I think the real value and the real push forward will uh, occur. So I'm going to try and start this animation. The first thing we need to do is segment wet from dry snow. With a radar, that's pretty easy to do. Um, I'm showing an example from C-band radar. So the Radarsat Constellation mission combined with Sentinel-1 data. Um, just some great examples over uh, Northern Canada. So if we pay attention to some of the permanent uh, land ice here on Ellesmere Island, as we get into the melt season, you'll see the bright white radar return turn dark, go black. So we just saw it there. That's the snow line, the snow melt line advancing in uh, ele elevation on these ice sheets. So we can really take advantage of the radar returns to segment out dry snow from wet snow. That's useful information on its own, but really under dry snow conditions, what we can do is estimate, uh, estimate the snow mass. So that's kind of an example of how we can segment dry from wet snow. Just to revisit this bottom box here, um, at Environment and Climate Change Canada, we're using the SVS uh, model, um, snow vegetation and soil moisture model. Uh, sorry, snow vegetation and soil model. And, and so what we can do is configure the model to provide us with the microstructure information that we need to help inform our interpretation of the radar data. So this is just an example of the surface uh, snow optical uh, radius information from just a kind of random uh, date and time. But this just shows this is at the surface of the pack, but we can do uh, multi-layer runs with this as well. Um, and so we'll take the output from the physical snow model to help inform our um, uh, both assimilation of the backscatter data and our, our estimates of snow mass. So what will data assimilation in CalDAS look like? We could obviously spend hours talking about this on its own. It's a complex piece of the puzzle. But what I want to emphasize here is that there's good heritage uh, based on the assimilation of satellite data for soil moisture um, and the soil state. So right now, CalDAS assimilates L-band radiometer measurements from both the SMOS and the SMAP missions. Um, and that has allowed them to improve their treatment of soil uh, in CalDAS. We'd like to accomplish the same thing for the treatment of snow by assimilating KU band backscatter um, instead of the L band data. So clearly what you need is um, uh, some good modeling to do this, both on the radar side and the physical snow modeling side. It's not a trivial task to implement uh, a forward KU band radar model into CalDAS, but our colleagues uh, in Dorval are starting to go down this road uh, now. Um, and so this will be a really key kind of technical development piece is getting CalDAS configured so it can assimilate, um, do radiance-based um, uh, assimilation of the KU band radar measurements. On the national SWE product side, I wanna emphasize that again, this idea of taking the first guess information on SWE that comes from the, the model with the satellite remote sensing. We're looking at the Nelson Churchill watershed as an example here. What we wanted to look at was what are we missing out on? What regions will we be unable to image because forest is in the way? So forest is really a confounding layer that uh, complicates interpretation of the radar signal. And th the point here is that even in forested areas, there are areas in green that we can resolve uh, at the resolutions that we'll be measuring uh, with this radar system. And so we won't be, trying to retrieve SWE through dense forest. Uh, I'm sure there might be some research into those areas, but what we wanna do is take the model information where we can't use the radar and combine the radar and the modeling where we do have the radar information. So in that sense, um, it will allow us to merge information together to hopefully improve on what, what you get from just using the model on its own by informing model analysis with SWE estimates that come from the radar measurement. So it's this perspective of taking remote sensing information, combining it with the modeling to then give us uh, seamless coverage. Clearly we have to put some thought into how we communicate this to users. So for any given grid cell on any given day, 
the information might come from the model, it might come from the radar, it might come from both. So what, you know, this is really one of the key tasks uh, ahead of us is to continue to develop um, this approach to doing um, this sort of data merging on a, on a national scale. So we have been acquiring airborne KU band data. Our colleagues in the US have been very helpful in this regard. So NASA has funded some of these measurements. Um, we worked at Trail Valley Creek a couple of winters ago. Um, you can see corner reflectors in the radar returns showing this example image here. I don't wanna to spend too much time on this, but we are now receiving radar data uh, from our US colleagues. We took the approach of, of uh, sampling a fairly small area but acquiring a lot of radar data from different look geometries uh, over this region. My colleague, Josh King has done a lot of work on this. And what we're just showing here is if we take one area and we fly it many, many times with an airborne radar, we get a lot of overlap. We get a lot of different looks at the same surface target. And we know a lot about the snow at that surface because we were in the field uh, making uh, measurements at that time. And what we can see is that we'll have this sweet spot in incidence angle these are for five different snow cover sites that we're looking many different uh, incidence angles from the radar at. At too short of a path length, we're not gonna get any information on the snow. At too long of an incidence angle, you lose most of the radar uh, return signal. But there's this real sweet spot between 25 and 55 degrees, which is exactly the incidence angle range of our proposed satellite system where the response looks excellent. And so the radar data, you know, there's a lot of detail here that I can't go into, but the response that we're seeing from the radar data uh, from the aircraft is, is super positive and indicates that you know, we're focusing in on the right incidence angle range um, and we're seeing a nice response to volume scatter uh, of the snowpack across this incidence angle range. I think I'll, um, so I'll just maybe say quickly here that if we look at, at one point uh, at Trail, Trail Valley Creek from November, January, and then into March, so we're getting uh, three times in the winter season when we flew the radar, we're seeing a change in backscatter across different incidence angles from each of these time periods. That's good. So as the snow depth is increasing from November to January, we're seeing a change in the backscatter. Looks a little noisy into March. That's because there wasn't much of a change in depth, but the microstructure of the snowpack changed a lot. So the radar is responding to that change, the growth of depth hoar crystals in the snowpack, that change in the microstructure. So we have a lot more analysis to do with this uh, airborne data but we're really uh, encouraged uh, so far with, with what we've seen um, from the analysis done so far. I think I'll, I won't go into much, much detail here. It's just showing how we would uh, retrieve SWE, where basically we have observed backscatter. We get a microstructure first guess from our snow model. We have a forward modeling component, and that allows us then um, to, to, to minimize this cost function to estimate SWE. A key part of this, which I don't have time to go into, is this microstructure output from uh, from the snow model. We're putting a lot of effort into using field measurements to evaluate the simulations. This is one example from the Trail by the Creek area where we take very detailed surface observations with a snow micropenetrometer to get a profile uh, of specific surface area of the snow grains. And then the black circles are the um, simulations from the snow model. And overall, the performance uh, seems quite good. So a lot more work to do here, but um, again, this integration of the modeling and the remote sensing is really gonna be uh, important. So where are we with the mission? Just a couple of slides to, to end up here. Um, we're in a what's called a planning phase at CSA right now, um, which is, uh, it's a really positive time for the mission, I must say. So CSA is funding development of a, 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 a simulator for the mission that will provide synthetic KU band data uh, across Canada. We'd like to share this tool with interested scientific colleagues um, so that's still a year out or so from being uh, ready, but we're working hard on that. CSA is also investing in um, te technology development to experiment with the KU band radar subarray. There's been some excellent progress made by our colleagues in uh, industry uh, across Canada, and there's funding for that work to continue over the next couple of years. What we don't have is full funding for the entire mission. Um, but we do have funding to continue moving the mission forward down the mission um, development pathway, and we'll have to seek full funding for the mission uh, within the next couple of years. Um, maybe just also to highlight that it's a snow mission. It's being driven by our needs in the seasonal snow community, but there will be many times of the year when there's not snow on the ground. 
Uh, and so uh, there's capacity to use this KU band radar data um, for other research questions as well. Engagement with partners is really uh, important to us, especially in this mission planning phase. So we're uh, linked in quite closely with the NHS colleagues at, uh, um, at, uh, um, at, at EC. We've talked to Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. They're, they're very interested both for snow applications, but also using KU band radar to look at crops during the growing season. And then really, we've had really positive interactions with our global water futures and GIWS uh, friends. So it's obviously, it's really important to us that our, uh, that as Environment Canada and CSA move the mission forward, that it, it's relevant to our uh, university colleagues, that we can partner together on field programs in the future, on the use of mission products, modeling support, all of these things, connection to end users. Uh, we've we, we benefit greatly from our global water futures connections here, and uh, it's been a it's a, it's it's been a really super help. Um, so that's kind of where where we stand um, uh, with uh, with the mission development at this point. It's a really uh, interesting time moving forward. So I'll summarize here. Um, I covered a lot of ground today, uh, so hopefully I didn't saturate you with with too many things. I did want to spend time at the beginning kind of going through what we can do with existing snow mass products. So my intent was to sort of show, okay, with existing snow mass products, what can we do? Well, we can look at trends over time. We can assess climate models. Um, uh, we have limitations obviously in mountain areas, but by using an ensemble of products, we can answer some pretty important questions relating to snow uh, and the climate system. Um, Constructing and maintaining this multi data set observational ensemble actually is a lot of work, more than we thought going into it. You have to benchmark new data sets. Some data sets are not updated consistently. Some new products appear, some older products disappear. So it's been a real pain to kind of maintain this product ensemble, um, but it's been, it's been useful. But what's been a, a key thing is that Earth observation actually plays a pretty small role. So we lean pretty heavily on re analysis and snow models. Um, with only the Snow CCI product um, using Earth, Earth obs observation data. So moving forward, we want to push the terrestrial snow mass mission as uh, sort of the new paradigm in remote sensing of snow mass, um, which will address gaps that we have um, from our current, our current snow products. So I'll stop here. I think we have time for some questions and some comments. And I'll stop sharing my screen because I have a hard time seeing people's faces when I'm in share screen mode. So maybe I'll stop sharing and uh, take it take it from there. So thanks a lot for your attention. I really, uh, really appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, that was a fantastic talk. Uh, we'll be now moving towards a Q&A session. So I have a first question from Amir and I, he's asking a question about the block spot that you were showing for the CMIP6 and CMIP5. Uh, so uh, talking about the snow extent box part comparing uh, CMIP5 and CMIP6, I see large uncertainty in CMIP6, uh, the box was I stretched. Uh, could, it be the, could it be the reason why the observation were captured well compared to CMIP5? Yeah, that's a great, great question. Now I will try to share my screen again so I can show those, show those plots. Ba, 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 ba. I think it was this one here. <clears throat> So, so yeah, so, so there was, um, so the question is about the CMIP-5 versus CMIP-6. So five is on the left. So yeah, you can see uh, in, in my view that the new climate models have a slightly tighter range. Maybe that's not true for all months. So you can see some of these months where we get better agreement, like in March, there is, as the question pointed out, actually an increase in, in the intermodel range. So that may be accounting for some of this uh, better uh, agreement that's right between the models and the observations. But I think in general, what we're seeing in the CMET models is they generally tended to underestimate snow extent um, and they've the, the, the climatological values have increased. Yes, the range also has increased. So I think we have to look at some of the individual models, look at some of the outliers and understand um, why that's happening. So we did in the paper that we looked at the CMIP-6 models, which uh, my colleague Lawrence led, I think it's this citation here. Um, we did look at some of the parameterizations in the models, but I would say at a fairly high level. Um, and so I think there's a lot of a ground yet to be covered here with understanding how CMIP-6 models differ from CMIP-5. Thanks. Uh, there's a question from John. Uh, 
So it creates great talk and significant developments uh, for application in mountains and other complex environments. Uh, would there be interest in assimilating uh, high resolution snow site observations into high resolution snow redistribution models, uh, such as Canadian hydrological model that uh, GWF is developing? Yeah, that's that's a great point raised by John. So, so what I kind of talked about today was how at the environment candle level, we've sort of pitched our vision for using um, uh, satellite data at our at the national scale at which a lot of our prediction systems are operating. But there are other flexible and higher resolution modeling frameworks that we could also easily couple um, um, the remote sensing with the modeling. And so what we're pushing uh, from the Canadian Space Agency is um, as they're investing now and in moving the mission forward, investing in some studies with university colleagues to look at some of this outside of the Environment Canada modeling system, I think would be really useful. So the framework for that will probably be the mission simulator project that I, I mentioned just briefly. So it, let's say a year from now, we'll have a system in place that can generate for any watershed in Canada, uh, synthetic radar measurements over a winter season. So we could then do experiments at, with different modeling systems to look at the impact that that data has with an eye towards what would happen when we actually had um, uh, the real um, satellite data. So it might seem like a, a year is a ways off to get to that problem, but uh, from a timeline point of view, we're still looking optimistically, I would say at like a late 2020s to 2030, like 2028 to 2030 launch date, should we be successful in pushing the mission forward. So we have a lot of time um, still, I think, to, um, to look into some of these questions, but uh, as as John has raised, I think that's a, a we could definitely look at look at that sort of thing. And using the um, CHM would be a great a great tool to add into the mix for sure. Thanks. Uh, the next question is from Andre. Uh, are there any strategies already thought out to separate between uh, precipitation and snow mass on the ground uh, KU band retrievals? Yeah, that's a real tricky one. Uh, we've, you know, um, obviously like the Snow on the ground is what this mission is focused on. So once the snowfall hits the ground, that's when we're um, measuring it. We also know that snow accumulation on the ground is not a simple additive function of all the snowfall um, because of other processes like sublimation, those sorts of things. So, um, you know, we have looked a little bit at whether you could use, you know, CloudSat, for instance, to look at precipitation products and flag, okay, a precipitation product says there's been a snowfall event. How does that compare to the Delta SWE that we retrieve from a satellite mission? It's been difficult to do that. Um, and so I wouldn't say we've made great progress in that area, but this, I guess, just at a sort of general sense, this relationship between precipitation or snowfall and snow mass um, uh, is important to look at. And, you know, within uh, the Environment Canada system, we will have, you know, Kappa derived precipitation estimates um, that will be sort of integrated into the mission analysis. Uh, thanks. Uh, the last question has a series of questions and they are technicals. Uh, so Allah says, I have a technical question. Uh, mm -hmm. Why LiDAR sensor, sensor platform has not, uh, considered into, has not been considered into your sensor system as a multi-sensor mission in addition to QU band radar system? And to add to that, uh, how the QU band radar is sensitive to snow ice and snow grain size? And the final one is, uh, what is the expected uncertainty of Q band compared to the ground-based observations? Yeah, those are great questions. So first on the on the LIDAR side, so LIDAR obviously is, it's a great approach from, uh, from drone platforms, from airborne, from uh, fixed wing and helicopter-based uh, systems is great. Um, and there are space-borne LIDARs like, um, like the ISAT mission the problem for terrestrial snow is, um, you know, you get very narrow swaths with, with a, a, a LIDAR system from space. Um, there's pointing accuracy issues. Um, there's uh, some cloud cover issues. It really was difficult to build up the coverage that we would want, you know, over Canada from a space-borne uh, LIDAR platform. As well, they're very expensive. So we can actually do a radar for much lower cost. Um, so that's why we, you know, we did initially consider LIDAR a little bit, but it quickly became clear that it wasn't uh, a cost-effective solution. Now, all that saying, as we think about if you had a satellite mission, what your what your CalVal program would look like, 
I think LIDAR is absolutely uh, uh, essential piece of that. And in fact, when we flew the, um, the airborne radar, we always try to fly a LIDAR along with the radar because getting that snow depth information from the LIDAR helps a lot in interpreting um, the uh, radar data. So talking about sensitivity to snow grain size, it's just, it's a frequency thing. So we're at, at the KU band uh, wavelength, that's you getting volume interaction with the snowpack, which is what we want. But you know the wavelength is getting close to the, the size of the grains of the snowpack. So there's a direct uh, impact there. Um, I think what the community has made such huge strides um, over the past decade in making quantitative snow microstructure measurements in the field. Um, our physical snow models have made great strides in being able to simulate microstructure um, and so I think a decade ago with the Core H2O, this microstructure complication was kind of viewed as a bit of a deal breaker for some people with the mission. It was like, you, you, you need to know too much about microstructure to have the mission be of any use. That was some of the criticism that came up of that mission. I think now we're in a much better position to argue against those types of criticisms because we can simulate microstructure, we can measure it in the field um, and we understand the impact on the backscatter uh, in a much clearer way. Also, that's why we want the two KU band frequencies. So we don't want just one measurement. We want two different frequencies that are separated a little bit. And because they're separated, they will respond differently to both SWE and microstructure. So we get sort of two um, uh, measurements to use from space, which is a great advantage over using only one. And your last question was about uncertainty in the KU band. Um, our hope is that um, we'll be at around the 25 to 30 percent uh, RMSE. Um, that's what sort of synthetic sensitivity experiments show us, but we need to do a lot more work to um, dial that in a little bit. And one thing I didn't mention was that we are moving towards doing more airborne experiments um, with Global Water Futures as well, being a key partner in that. Um, so we'd like to make some measurements in the Bow River we like to make some measurements in the Red River. We need to do more airborne remote sensing in the next couple of years to help advance the retrievals, to help uh, help us dial in a bit what our expected um, um, uncertainty range of, of our SWE estimates would be. Thanks. Uh, the next question is from Martin. Uh, he mm -hmm. says, hi, Chris. Uh, this was a great presentation. Uh, I appreciate your work in combining different model products. Uh, you are effectively using an ensemble of opportunity which can provide bias estimates of uncertainty. Uh, you are assuming that the difference among the products is a good proxy for the uncertainty. Uh, can you talk about a process that you can use to improve estimates of uncertainty in snow products? Yeah, that, thanks, thanks, Martin. That's that's a great question. So you're exactly right. It's an ensemble of uh, opportunity, and we've really in the past leaned. Uh, so the, the first comparison we did, we entirely used uncertainty or spread between products as a proxy for, so spread was a proxy for un uncertainty. We didn't use any reference data. So we just sort of said where the products agree, we've got more confidence in them, where they disagree, we have less confidence. That was useful, but uh, limited in some ways. So now we've used this uh, ground reference network of snow course data to try and attach actual performance metrics to the products. That gets challenging because the you know, it's a, basically a point versus area comparison. So one thing we're looking at now is running some of these uh, temperature index models, or for instance, the Crocus snow model with different uh, forcing data sets. So you use different forcing applied to the same model, and then you apply the same forcing to different models. And that um, helps us tease out a bit the uncertainty that's due to the reanalysis re forcing, and then the uncertainty that's due you know, to the snow model or the land surface model component of those products. Um, so, so that's that's one one thing we're trying to do. The other thing that's becoming apparent that I didn't show today is that for these reanalysis sort of snow modeling products, the resolution of them, the spatial grid spacing, really makes a difference. So, Era Five land is now at nine kilometer uh, grid spacing. I didn't show these results today, but we've compared native Era Five. Era 5 land. We have some other Era 5 snow products that our colleagues in Europe have run for us. And it turns out that just having improved spatial resolution seems to go a long way. So these Era 5 products seem quite good and Era 5 land in particular looks excellent. Um, whether that holds up 
for mountain areas, of course, that needs a bit more work still um, to assess that. That might be a challenge. Um, but yeah, lots of different approaches we can use because there's not one single technique I think that's perfect for quantifying the un uncertainty in these products. We want to use different approaches to try to get a kind of robust understanding of the strengths and weaknesses of the various products. Uh, there's a last question from Dave, and I think you already touched upon into it. Uh, so given the new mission concept, what scale of reduction of uh, SWE RMSC do you hope to achieve? Uh, is there any identification of a threshold RMSC which is needed or desired? Yeah, that's that's a great question, Dave. Thanks, thanks for that. So right now with uh, with Globe Snow or the Snow CCI product, and for all those sort of land surface model products, the RMSC, you know, it's about 40 millimeters, uh, 35 to 40 millimeters. We like to think we could get that down to 20 to 25, or maybe you know, it depends how you express the error, whether you use a percentage or an absolute number. But we think there's room for improvement, uh, you know, on that sort of 40 millimeter RMSC that we're getting. Uh, from from current products now, and and I think you know the other the other key is that even if you had 25 kilometer grid space products with a low RMSE, they still don't provide the spatial information that a lot of users need. So um, that's another piece of the puzzle that we'll hopefully address with the higher uh, resolution um, radar mission. Uh, thanks. Uh, lastly, I quickly wanted to say that uh, often we use, you know, Sweet for Uphill 1 as an index for H2 for forecasting, but because of a lot of midwinter melts, uh, and as you move towards warming climate, you know, you will see more, more of those midwinter melts. So they don't, the Sweet data in Uphill 1 doesn't tell the whole story. So a lot of focus in this new mission is in the spatial coverage, but I think even the temporal data we get will be very valuable. So mm -hmm. it's not a question, just wanted to say that. Uh, I think we're coming uh, close to our uh, talk today. Yeah. So thank you again, uh, Chris. Uh, yeah, thanks say? a lot. Yeah, maybe just my uh, my closing comment was like, it was you know, we, we have a very active snow research program in our group. Um, Global Water Futures, obviously super active in this area. And I really think we're moving towards um, enhanced collaboration. Between, and I know there has been excellent collaboration between Global Water Futures and uh, EC in the past. I'm excited about the collaborations we can develop moving forward. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, desire uh, within government to really you know, continue to, to build these ties with our Global Water Futures uh, colleagues. And I think kind of snow provides a great framework for that. So I really appreciate the chance to talk about snow and our research program today. And I look forward to, to more contact uh, with all of you. Great stuff, thanks. Uh, thank you again, Chris. And I want to thank everyone that attended this webinar. Uh, the video recording will be available later today uh, in our morning website. Uh, just a note that next week, uh, we will we'll not be having a webinar due to public holiday in Canada. Uh, we'll be returning on Thursday, July 8th with a webinar on understanding, modeling, and predicting uh, special floods and droughts by Dr. Manuela Brunner from the University of Freiburg in Germany. So please stay tuned. Uh, that will be all for today. Uh, thank you again, and please stay safe. I wish you a good day. Cheers.